beginning, there was God. Nothing else. No trees, no seas, no whales or snails, or bats or cats. No puppies or guppies? Right. No stars or Mars, no human beings, not anything. Just God. But wasn't he kind of lonely? I sure would have been. <laughs> Me too. But God wasn't alone in all that nothingness. You see, God is like us in some ways. God thinks and feels and acts, but in other ways, he is very different. What do you mean, different? Well, for one thing, God is everywhere, all the time. Everywhere? Here, there, everywhere, all at the same time. Wow, that is different. And he knows everything. Everything? Every single thing. Wowee, he sure is smart. Yes, he is. And he is never, ever wrong. Oh. He sure is, not like me or anyone I know. <laughs> You're right. And there's one other thing that makes God absolutely different than anyone else. And this one's kind of tricky. What's that? God is more than one. There is one God and there are three persons in God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Wait, what? There is one God, but there are three persons in God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Um, that's a little... Hard to understand? I know. I told you it was tricky. But that is why God wasn't lonely. Because he wasn't alone. There is love within God. There is friendship within God. There is family within God. That is amazing. He is amazing. And one day, this amazing God decided... It's time to begin. So, he started making stuff. And boom! All of a sudden, there were... Stars! Planets! Galaxies! Wow! And God said... Very good. Then he picked one particular planet and said... Watch this. God made the oceans, mountains, plants, and trees that grow. Tiny little leafy ones smaller than a pebble and big giant ones that climb toward the sun. God said, Very good. But he wasn't done. Next he made all kinds of... Swimmy creatures. Crawly creatures. <laughs> Birds. And whales. Gentle sloths. And woolly mammoths. All the creatures God made were amazing. <laughs> Some so very short. And others so very tall. But something was missing. Really? What could possibly be missing? None of the creatures were like God. They couldn't think the way God thought, feel the way God felt, act the way God acted, and... These creatures couldn't join the friendship that God had within himself. So, what did God do? He said, Watch this. And then, God made something super special. A creature that could think and feel and act just like he could think and feel and act. A creature that could join God's family. What was it? What did he make? He made a man and a woman. God made us. 
Then he looked at everything he had made, and God said, Very good. <laughs> very, very good indeed. God created a great big universe with tons of shining stars, a bright burning sun, and do you remember what else? Yep, planets. Right. Then he took a planet and filled it with so many special things. Earth, that's where we live. Right again. And on the Earth, he made two very special creatures. Oh, oh. No, those aren't the creatures I'm talking about. Keep guessing. A platypus and sloth? A dog and a cat? A lizard and a blobfish? Oh, I give up. A man and a woman. I knew it. Well, actually I didn't. But now I do. <laughs> God named the man... Adam. And the woman he named... Eve. Now, the earth was a pretty wild place. So, God planted a garden for Adam and Eve to live in. Wow! How cool is that? God called the garden Eden. And inside the garden, Adam and Eve had everything they needed. And best of all... We are friends with God. But friendship only works if there is something very important. Trust. If Adam and Eve wanted to continue to be God's friends, they needed to trust Him. They needed to listen to God. Trusting God should be easy, since He loves us so much, and He knows everything. And it was easy, for a while. Just a while? You see, there was this one tree. I thought there were lots of trees in the garden. Oh, there were. But... There was this one particular tree in the garden that was different. God said, Don't eat from that tree. So they had a gazillion trees with all the fruit they could want. And just one they couldn't touch? Yep. Just that one? Uh-huh. <laughs> Easy peasy. It should have been. And Adam and Eve were just fine doing as God had told them, up until a new voice showed up in the garden. A new voice? Who was it? It was the voice of the enemy of God, and it was coming from a sneaky, tricky snake that said, Are you sure God said you can't eat the fruit from that tree? Oh, we're, we're sure. sure. God said that if we eat that fruit, we will die. And then the snake did something that no one had ever <laughs> done before in God's beautiful world. The snake lied. <laughs> you will surely not die. Huh? huh? No. If you eat of that tree, you'll become wise and smart like God. That doesn't sound right. So for sure they stopped listening to the sneaky snake and walked away, right? <sighs> no. What? No way! They thought about what the snake said. It would be great to be as wise as God. Then we'd know everything too. Hmm. What, what to, to do? do? What, what to, to do? do? What did they do? Adam and Eve decided to trust the snake and go their own way. They did what God told them not to do. They ate the fruit. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no! At that moment, sin entered God's wonderful world. 
You see, sin is when we ignore God and choose our own way, just like Adam and Eve did. That sneaky snake! He lied to Adam and Eve, and they listened to him instead of God? This is a terrible story. Hmm. Yes, that snake was terribly <laughs> sneaky. And since Adam and Eve sinned, they had to leave the garden. But don't worry, the story's not over yet. It isn't? What happened next? God had a plan. He loved his creation, and he wasn't going to let some sneaky old snake spoil it. What that sneaky snake didn't know was that God was going to do something very special to save the world from sin and make things right again. I knew God wouldn't let that snake ruin everything. Remember what happened to Adam and Eve? I sure do. Adam and Eve decided to trust a sneaky snake instead of God. And because of that, something really, really bad happened. Yes, sin entered the world. Sin is when we turn away from God and say, I don't care what you say, God. I'm going to do things my way. See, we can't be close to God when we turn away from him. Right. Wrong way. The sneaky snake knew that if he could get Adam and Eve to sin, then they couldn't be close to God. What a sneaky thing to do. Sneaky and bad. Because sin gets us into trouble. Hmm. This sign says God's way, but that way looks better. I'm going to go my own way. That must have hurt. And sin brings hurt, too. Because of their sin, Adam and Eve had to leave the garden. They couldn't be God's friends anymore. They had to live in the wild world, all by themselves. <laughs> the wonder of God's garden was no longer a part of their lives. We shouldn't have eaten that fruit. Oh, now you tell me. Where were you when I was being tempted? Well, I, I was right there! Exactly! <laughs> Just as I planned. God was very sad to see Adam and Eve living apart from him because of their sin, and to eventually see sin spread to their kids, and then their kids, and then their kids. Sin wrecked everything. It did. But guess what? God had a plan for us. Oh, good. Oh, triple good. What was it? A rescue plan. God had a plan to make things right. You mean by sending Jesus? Yes, to save Adam and Eve and their kids. And their kids' kids. And their kids' kids' kids. All the way down to us. Yippee! God's plan saves us from three things. The stain of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. What does that even mean? First, he wants to save us from the stain of sin. When we choose to sin and turn away from God, we have the stain of sin on us. But Jesus washes away our stain of sin and changes us into people who want to be close to Him. Right. Second, God wants to save us from the power of sin. The more we sin, the easier it is to keep on sinning. And soon, sin takes over our lives. But Jesus gives us the power to ignore the whispers of sin and live with peace and joy and love. That's way better than sin. It sure is. And third, even though God saves us from the stain of sin and the power of sin, we still live with the presence of sin. 
The presence of sin means we still live in a world where sin is all around us. Tears and hurt, selfishness and meanness. God wants to save us from the presence of sin. Uh, how? When the time is right, God will make it so his family can live in the wonderful world the way he meant it to be. But when will that happen? We don't know yet. When God says the time is right. So what happened with sin back then? God saw that sin was spreading. His beautiful world was drowning in sin. God knew there was only one way to stop his world from drowning in sin. What was that? Drown the sin. Adam and Eve had to leave the Garden of Eden and settle in a new place. Yes, because they sinned. They went their own way instead of God's way. Yep, and after a while they had kids. And then their kids had kids. Grandkids! And their grandkids had great-grandkids. Then the great-great-grandkids had kids. And as all those people spread around the world, Something else was spreading, too. Sin. People were choosing their own way instead of God's way. Fighting, stealing, lying and hurting each other, and making God's world a very ugly place. Until finally, God said, Enough. It's time to start over. Start over? How? God picked one person to start his world over again. Noah! Noah was a righteous man. He tried very hard to make right choices. In a world where everyone was doing their own thing, Noah was always ready to do what God asked. He had been practicing listening to God and being obedient for a long time. More than 500 years. How could anyone be that old? <laughs> People lived a long time back then. Are you all right? I was thinking about the candles on his birthday cake. Happy birthday! <laughs> I see. So God said to Noah, I want you to build a boat. What's a boat? A thing you can float in if there's a flood. What's a flood? It's when water covers everything. It's why you need a boat. How big? Big enough for your family and some animals. Uh, how many animals? All of them. Two of every kind. <laughs> then God gave him plans for building the big boat. Noah was already so old. Building a boat that big would take a long time. Right. It took Noah and his family years and years and years. Hey, Dad, are we done yet? Not yet. Now are we done? Nope. On top of that, Noah's neighbors probably came by to laugh at him. So it's called a boat. And it's for floating on water? Yep. <laughs> There's no water anywhere. Poor Noah. He was just doing what God told him. Yes, he wanted to be God's friend even if everyone else thought he was silly. <laughs> Finally, one day, a drop fell from the sky. Hey! Then another, and another, and another. And then... The animals started to come? Yep. God sent them to Noah, and Noah packed them all into his big, big boat. Now are we done? Then God closed the door. 
We are. The rain continued to come down, harder and harder. Suddenly, having a boat looked like a pretty good idea. The water rose higher and higher. God covered the land with water. So that all the fighting and hurting died, but so did most of God's creation. That's sad. It was very sad. It rained and poured for forty days, and Noah's big, big boat floated on the water fifty days, sixty days, one hundred days, one hundred and fifty days. That is a long time. It was. Then, finally, the water started to go down, 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 until one day, Noah's big, big boat came to rest on top of a mountain. And God said, "Let's start again." So, Noah and his family, plus a bunch of seasick animals. Walked out of the big, big boat into a clean, fresh world. I have placed a rainbow in the sky as my promise that I will never again flood the earth. It was time to start again. Did you ever hear about God's three promises to Abraham? Yes, I have. Well, maybe, kinda. Well, no. <laughs> well, a long, long time ago, God promised Abraham three things. Number one, his family would become a great nation. <laughs> Number two, they would have their very own land. The promised land. <laughs> and number three, through that nation would come a blessing for the whole world. Whoa! Yay! Whoa! Pretty great promises, huh? Really great promises. But then something happened. Uh oh! What? Jerusalem was destroyed, and the Israelites were stuck in Babylon, far away from the Promised Land. So, it seemed like none, none of those promises, promises are coming true. true. Israel was supposed to be a great nation, but now they weren't a nation at all. How could a blessing for the whole world come from Israel now? We don't know. God's promises confused the Israelites living in Babylon. They wondered if these promises would still come true, and if they could still trust God. Is our story over? Is this the end? Well, God knew how confused they were, so He sent the prophet Isaiah to give them one of the most important messages in the whole Bible. In the whole Bible, what was the message? It's not the end, Isaiah said. In fact, just wait till you hear what God is going to do next. Well, the Israelites were super excited! Yay! Why? Because Isaiah told them about the Messiah. Wait, what's that? The Messiah? Messiah means anointed one. Samuel had anointed young David with oil, which means that he was being set apart by God for a very special job, to be king of all Israel. And now Isaiah was saying that there was another anointed one coming. A baby will be born. He will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Which means God with us, but he would also have another name, 
the baby would be from King David's family, and he would grow up to rule God's people forever. Wow! Forever is like a really long time! It turns out the hope of the world wasn't a mighty nation or a big army. The hope of the world was going to be... A baby? <laughs> you got it! Now, can you guess the baby's name? Oh, I know, I know! Jesus! Remember God's three promises to Abraham? Actually, I do. His family would become a great nation. They would have their very own land, the promised land. And through that nation, a blessing would come for the whole world. Right. Well, after 1,500 years, two of those promises had come true. Amazing! And what about the third promise? You mean the promise of the blessing for the whole world? The one that promised the Messiah? The Anointed One? That's the one! Had that one come true too? Uh, no. Oh. Many years had passed since the time Isaiah had spoken about that promise, and the Israelites, well, you can imagine what they were saying. Where's the blessing? Where's the Messiah? Is he ever going to show up? Oh, we're, we're starting, starting to lose hope. hope. But then, something amazing happened. Really? What? In a village called Nazareth, there was a young woman named... Mary. One day, God sent an angel to give her a special message. A special message? What was it? The angel said, You will have a son. A son? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm not even married. Mary wasn't married yet, but she had promised to marry a man named... Joseph! Then the angel said something truly amazing. The baby will be a blessing for the whole world. He will be... The Son of God. That's the promise they were waiting for. Yes, Mary would give birth to the Son of God, the blessing for the whole world. That's so amazing. And if you were shocked to hear about this, you can imagine what Mary must have felt like. Why, you would think she would have passed out and fallen on the floor right then. Uh. <laughs> But Mary was brave. She trusted God, and she said, I am the servant of the Lord. May this happen just as you have said. Wow! Mary really trusted God. Yes, she did. Then the angel said, The baby's name will be Jesus. Was this the Messiah the people had been waiting for? <laughs> you got it! I knew it! So then what happened? Well, when it was time for the baby to be born, Joseph and Mary traveled to a place called Bethlehem. Was that a long ways away? It was, and they got there by... A donkey! That must have been hard. I think so. And on top of that, when they got to Bethlehem, they suddenly needed a place for Mary to have the baby. Oh, did they look for a hospital? <laughs> they didn't have hospitals back then. What about a palace? I mean, the Son of God should be born in the best place, right? Well... They... Or the best hotel? All the inns were full. So, what did they do? 
Since all the inns were full, Mary had her baby in... A barn. A barn. The blessing that Israel had been awaiting for almost 2,000 years was born in a... <laughs> a barn. Oh, my! Mary didn't have her baby in a fancy palace or a nice warm inn. Nope. Jesus was born in a stinky, smelly barn next to cows and sheep and goats and chickens. The promised blessing for the whole world had finally come, but he didn't arrive quite the way people expected. God kept his promise to Israel. The Messiah had come. And although he was born in a humble barn and not in a fancy palace or the best inn, God's kingdom celebrated in a most amazing way. Really? How? Like this. Angels. A whole bunch of them showed up and they sang and celebrated the birth of the new king. King Jesus! And where do you think God's mighty angels announced the birth of his son? Oh, I know. That's easy. They probably announced it in the biggest cities to the richest, fanciest, most important people of the whole wide world. Like kings and queens. No. Powerful generals? Ah, guess again. Oh, really rich people? <laughs> nope. Maybe this will help. <laughs> Shepherds. Look! Shepherds? Remember that God chose a humble barn for the birth of his son? Yeah, that is so weird. Right? I guess God doesn't do things the way we think he should. I guess not. So, the angels appeared in the middle of a field outside the city. That's right! They sang to shepherds. They did! Dirty, smelly guys. Hey! With dirty, smelly sheep. <laughs> Well, you know what I mean. God wanted to show how his love is for everyone, even the most gentle and lowly. Yay! <laughs> Go. You will recognize the Messiah by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in a blanket and lying in a manger. Go and see him. God showed the world his power, who he really was. Not with an army, but with a baby. Not in a palace, but in a barn. Not to kings and rich people, but to us, shepherds. God's rescue plan was happening. His kingdom was on the move. He was showing that his way of working was not going to be the way that people expected. It was going to be different. Yes, that little tiny newborn baby. Born in a barn. Celebrated by shepherds. Was going to turn the whole world. Whoa! Upside down. Ah. Do you know 
who this is? Oh, that's baby Jesus. I can tell because I know he was born in a barn. <laughs> yep, born in a barn instead of a palace. No one expected that. Do you know what else happened? Um, oh, a whole bunch of angels and shepherds showed up to celebrate. <laughs> and that's not even the whole story. There's more? Oh, yes. Sometime later, some wise men from the east followed a bright star in the sky to Jerusalem. They were really excited. Where can we find the newborn king? We saw his star in the sky. We want to worship him. And, and bring, bring him, him gifts, gifts, too. When the people heard about a new baby king, they got really excited, too. And soon the news reached King Herod. There was already a king? King Herod, and he was ruler over all the land. Well, when he heard all the talk about a new king, he got a little worried. So he called his counselors together. Counselors! I need to know where the child king is supposed to be born. <laughs> <clears throat> In Bethlehem. Aha! So Herod had the wise men brought to him right away and said, As soon as you find the child, let me know because I want to worship him too. Hmm. Okay. okay. So the wise men continued on their way, following the star. That must have been so awesome! Their very own compass in the sky! That's right! Soon the star stopped over the place where Jesus was. Ooh! We saw his star in the sky. We bring gifts fit for a king. Gold! Frankincense! Myrrh! And they bowed down and worshipped him. Wow! And then they went back to tell King Herod that they have found Jesus. Nope. What? Why not? God warned the wise men not to go back to King Herod. You see, Herod didn't really want to worship Jesus. He didn't? Not at all. Herod was jealous of the new baby king. So, after the wise men left Jesus and his family, an angel spoke to Jesus' dad, Joseph, in a dream and said, Take the baby and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, because Herod is looking for the child. Phew! So, Jesus was safe? Yes, he was. Yay! Jesus would grow up with his earthly parents in a faraway land until it was time to begin the work his heavenly father had sent him to do. Jesus and his disciples went all over Israel, showing everyone what the kingdom of God was like. Do you know how he did that? <laughs> oh, that's easy. By teaching them. Well, yes, but also by doing amazing, unbelievable, incredible, unimaginable things called miracles. Wow! But... Uh, what's a miracle? Miracles are signs that show people how powerful Jesus is. Let me tell you about three of his miracles. One night, Jesus was on a boat with his disciples when... Oh no! A huge storm has taken over the sea! We're going to sink! We're going to die! What are we going to do? Meanwhile, Jesus was... Sleeping? Like a baby. So, 
one of the disciples said, Uh, excuse me? Excuse me, Jesus? Yes, what is it? We're all going to die! So, Jesus sat up and said, <sighs> Why are you so afraid? Then, he turned to the giant storm and said, Stop! And guess what happened? The storm stopped. Wow! Jesus spoke to the storm and it obeyed him. Yep. Jesus was showing his disciples that in the kingdom of God, we have nothing to fear because... Jesus is the king of everything. Yes, he is. Another time, Jesus was surrounded by thousands of people who had followed him far away from town with no food to eat. Boy, am I hungry. Me too. Wish I'd brought a snack. Wish I'd brought two snacks. So, one of the disciples asked Jesus, Uh, excuse me, Jesus. Uh, how are we going to feed all these people? Will this help? Five loaves of bread and two small fish? <laughs> Five loaves, two... <laughs> you can't feed thousands of people with this. Are you sure? Hmm. But Jesus took the boy's gift and prayed over it. Then he started breaking pieces off and giving them to the people. And then there were more pieces. And more pieces. And more pieces. So many pieces that... Look! Every person got to eat as much as they wanted. Another miracle! The disciples must have been so surprised. Oh, they were. Jesus was giving them another sign. In God's kingdom, there is always enough. Enough food, enough warmth, enough love. Because Jesus is the king of everything. You're catching on. And another time, a desperate man ran to Jesus saying, My daughter is sick and dying. Can you please help her? By the time Jesus got to their house, the little girl had died. Oh, no! But Jesus said, Don't worry. She's okay. And the little girl came back to life, just like that. This was a sign that Jesus is king over sickness and disease. Jesus is the king of everything! Yes, he is. In the kingdom of God, there is no sickness or death. People must have been so excited. Oh, they were, but not all of them. Who wouldn't be excited about the miracles? I'll tell you, the religious leaders, the Pharisees. We keep track of all the rules, and we're not excited at all. Yeah, Jesus is getting too popular. Some people even call him a king. We gotta do something about this. So, the Pharisees went to the Sadducees. We're the ones in charge of punishing the people that break the rules. Let's talk. <laughs> the Pharisees and Sadducees didn't like all the amazing miracles Jesus was doing. How could they not be amazed by the miracles? Because they were too afraid Jesus would take over their jobs. Jesus is the king over everything. That's right. And God was about to use him to do the most incredible miracle of all time. Really? Yep. So the Pharisees and Sadducees began looking for a way to arrest Jesus to stop him from doing the work his father had sent him to do. The Last Supper 
It was time for Jesus and his disciples to celebrate the Passover. Passover? What is Passover? Do you remember when God sent Moses to rescue the Israelites from Egypt? Oh, yes. God sent frogs and flies and darkness and other things. It was pretty crazy. It was. God sent plague after plague, ten plagues. But Pharaoh still refused to let God's people go. He said, No, I will not let God's people go. So it was time for Pharaoh to see just how powerful God can be. What happened next? God told Moses to have every Israelite family prepare a lamb for a special meal and then take some of the blood from that lamb and put it over the door of their houses. Why would God tell them to do that? Because for the last plague, God would send an angel to take the life of every firstborn son of the Egyptians. The angel would pass over the homes of the Israelites who had the blood of the lamb over their doors. So the blood of the lamb saved the sons of the Israelites. And ever since that day, the Israelites have celebrated Passover with a special meal, just like the one they had that night in Egypt when the angel passed over their homes many, many years earlier. I get it now. So. Jesus and his disciples traveled to Jerusalem, where many people gathered to celebrate Passover. And something very wonderful happened when he got there. Oh, really? What? As Jesus rode into the city on a donkey, a big crowd of people came to meet him. They knew who he was? Yes, they were so excited. They waved palm branches and then laid them down in front of him. That's funny. What did they do that for? It was their way of honoring Jesus. Like a welcome mat. That's so cool. And then they shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was like a parade. A parade for a king. Everyone was so happy. Wait! 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 Stop everything! We're not happy at all. Not one teeny bit. Ah, yes. The Pharisees and Sadducees. Those religious leaders weren't happy. They were very nervous. Hey! Jesus is such a troublemaker. If the Romans hear people calling him king, they will send their soldiers to throw us in prison. We need to stop Jesus and his followers. So they came up with a secret plan to hurt Jesus. Oh no, they can't hurt Jesus. Don't worry, even this was part of God's plan. Later that night, Jesus and his disciples got together to eat the Passover meal, just like they did every year. But this year was different. During the meal, Jesus got up and washed his disciples' feet to show them what it really means to love and serve others. Then, Jesus said something that surprised them all. One of you is going to turn against me. Oh no! Why did he say that? Uh, he knew that one of them was helping the Pharisees and Sadducees. Were the disciples surprised? For sure. They looked at each other and said, Who could it be? Jesus knew what was going to happen. He wanted to prepare his followers. So he took a piece of bread and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Then he picked up his cup and said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, poured out for you. What did he mean by that? What does cov... cov... Covenant. What does that mean? A covenant is a promise. Many years before, God had made a covenant, a promise, to bless his people. Now, Jesus was saying that God was going to make a new covenant with them. He was going to bless them in a new way. But when he said, This is my body, 
This is my blood. It sounded like this new covenant had something to do with Jesus dying. And it did. What do you mean? Why would Jesus have to die? Remember when the angel in Egypt saw the blood of the lamb over the door? What did he do? Um, he passed over the house. And the people were safe. Jesus was saying that now his body and blood would save them. He was saying that he was the new Passover lamb. Whoa! The disciples could not believe their ears. Then, after dinner, Jesus took some of his disciples and went to a garden to pray. He knew what he had to do next, and he knew it was not going to be easy. After a while, he said, The hour has come. And just at that moment, one of his disciples arrived, leading a group of soldiers sent by the Sadducees to arrest Jesus. Which disciple was it? The disciple named Judas. Now everyone knew who had turned against Jesus. With the help of Judas, the Pharisees and Sadducees arrested Jesus. <gasps> Just like they planned. But you know what? Things did not go the way they planned. Jesus was going around doing the work God had sent him to do, healing people, <laughs> and teaching them all about the kingdom of God. But the Pharisees and Sadducees thought Jesus was getting too popular, so they had him arrested in the middle of the night. Oh no! What did they do to him? They asked him a lot of questions. Are you the Son of God? Do you think you are equal to God? Jesus didn't say anything, but the religious leaders didn't care if he answered or not. They accused him anyway. He is guilty of blasphemy! 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 Blasphemy? What does that even mean? Blasphemy is when someone says untrue things about God. The Pharisees and Sadducees accused Jesus of saying he was God. According to the Pharisees and Sadducees, there was only one way a person could pay for that. What was it? Going to jail? No, death. No! There was a problem for the Pharisees and Sadducees, though. What? Even if the Pharisees and Sadducees said Jesus was guilty, they weren't allowed to kill anyone. Only Roman leaders could do that. So they took him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Wait, what? Pancho the Pilate? Not a Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And when he saw Jesus and his accusers, he was a little confused. <laughs> Are they upset? <laughs> what have you done that has made everyone so angry? Again, Jesus didn't say anything. So Pilate turned to the religious leaders and said, I don't see anything wrong with this man. Well, according to our rules, he needs to die. Now, Pilate had a problem. Hmm. Jesus doesn't deserve to die. But... But if he gets more popular, I don't want the Pharisees and Sadducees to complain about me to the other Roman leaders. So, what did he do? He thought there was only one way to keep his job as Roman governor. Hmm. Well, what are you going to do? Uh, bring me some water. I wash my hands of this situation. This is not my fault. So... Pilate ordered that Jesus be killed on a wooden cross, because... According to our laws, he deserves to die. 
<gasps> that is so sad. Jesus didn't deserve to die on the cross. No, he didn't. But he went to the cross anyway. And as he was dying, he continued to show love and mercy by saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. The sky turned very dark, and Jesus said, It is finished. Jesus died. Then the ground began to shake, and a Roman guard standing nearby said, This man must have been the Son of God. But where were the disciples? All of Jesus' friends. His mother was with him and a few of his friends. The others probably didn't know what to think. How could Jesus be the Messiah, the blessing for the whole world, if he wasn't even alive? Jesus had done some amazing things while he was living. Like lots of miracles. That's right. Stop! And he'd shown everyone that God the Father was very loving and good and powerful. He had also promised that the kingdom of God was near. He'd given everyone a taste of that kingdom through those miracles. What's the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is when the whole world will be made new again, the way God had always wanted it to be. Jesus promised that someday in the kingdom of God there will be no sin, or sadness, or sickness, or death. What is sin again? Sin is when we ignore God and go our own way. Sin is when we say, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do it my way. And remember, because God is good and sin is bad, the price we pay for our sin is being apart from God. Oh! So in the kingdom of God, there will be no sin, or sadness, or sickness! In the kingdom of God, there will be nothing to be afraid of, not even death. But Jesus had just died. Ah, so it seemed like none of those promises were coming true. But that was not the case. Really? What do you mean? You see, something more amazing was happening that Jesus' enemies didn't realize. When he died on the cross, Jesus took all of our sin on himself. He did? You see, since our sin turns us away from God, there can be no sin in the kingdom of God. So, Jesus had to fix the problem of sin. And he did that by dying on the cross? Yes. By dying on the cross, Jesus paid the price for our sins. Yours, mine, everyone's. Wow! Jesus really loves us. He sure does. But... Another question? What about all the things that he said about the kingdom? I still don't get it. If Jesus was dead, how could any of those promises come true? That's a really good question, with an even better answer. Because he didn't stay dead. Jesus had been betrayed. He was arrested and put to death on a cross. It was a sad day. Yes, Jesus gave his life for us. The sun had gone down and it was time to bury him. Only his mom and a few friends were there. You remembered. So what did they do? They got help from a man. I am Joseph 
from Arimathea, a follower of Jesus. I am very sad that Jesus has died. I have been waiting for the kingdom he spoke of to come. I want to do something nice for him, to show Jesus how much I loved him. So Joseph did something special. He went to Pontius Pilate. I want to take care of Jesus' body. I want to give him a grave. All right, go ahead. Now, when important people died in Israel, they were not buried in the ground. Really? No, their bodies were placed in special tombs that were carved out of solid rock. You mean like a cave? Like a small cave. Well, Joseph had one that he was going to use someday, but guess what? He decided to give it to Jesus. So, Jesus' body was placed inside Joseph's tomb, and then a big rock was rolled in front of the cave, so no one could get in. And then... Someone is here to see you, Pilate. Oh, it's you again. Yup, we're back! You didn't think we'd give up that easily, did you? <sighs> what do you want? Look, Jesus said that he would come back from the dead. And? Well, what if his friends go to the tomb, move the rock, and take his body and then say, Jesus is alive! Hmm. That would cause a lot of trouble for you, Pilate. Hmm, I never thought of that. So Pilate put guards outside the tomb to make sure no one moved the rock. Eyes peeled. We don't want anyone to move this rock. Yeah, no one's gonna get past us. No, sir. Wow, so the Pharisees and the Sadducees were still worried about Jesus? Yep. You see, when Jesus was alive, he said, In three days, I will rise from the dead. Well, Jesus had died and was buried on a Friday. That's day one. All day Saturday, his body lay in Joseph's tomb with the guards keeping watch. That was day two? Right. So Sunday morning comes around. Day three! and two women who were Jesus' friends made their way to the tomb to put spices and perfume on his body, cause that was something that people did in those days. When all of a sudden... Ah! Oh, oh, oh! What happened? What, what happened? happened? An earthquake shook the ground, and an angel appeared. <laughs> I am oh. The angel rolled away the rock. When the women arrived, there lay the two soldiers, passed out on the ground. There lay the rock, and there, well, there was no Jesus. Don't be afraid. Oh, uh, okay. I know you're looking for Jesus, but he isn't here. He has risen. Just like he said he would, Jesus is alive. What? What? The women were so excited. They wanted to go tell their other friends what happened, when suddenly... Don't be afraid. Jesus showed up? He sure did. No way! Yes way. Later, Jesus appeared to all his disciples. He explained to them why he had to die. He told them the great news that death has no power in God's kingdom. And then, when it was time for him to leave, he said, From now on, you will be the ones telling others about my kingdom. I will send you a helper who will fill you with the power of God. You will do amazing things. And then, Jesus rose up into the sky. Amazing! The disciples were very excited. They didn't really know what would happen next, but they knew one thing. 
Jesus was sending them a helper who would help them in a mighty big way. <laughs> 